There was a lot of hope in the Obama campaign that they hadn't just won the presidency in 2008, but that they had built a, uh, an online community and, a, and a, that, that was going to be a, an activist organisation that was actually going to win those midterm elections in 2010. Organising for America. Right, that was yeah, <laughs> organising for America. So uh, what happened to that? Is, is that have have people just realised that nobody, <laughs> nobody cares after the presidential election's over, the confetti's um, fallen? There is a, a sort of a, a, a group called Organizing <coughs> for America that came out of Obama for America. It's still alive and well-ish. Um, it's still Democracy for America, which came out of Dean for America. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think that it, it sends out emails about sort of specific issues. There, it's, it's more of an issues-based campaign this, these days. So they've done, they did a huge push on healthcare and enrollment. Um, so healthcare enrollment was a really big thing for them. They've done some on environmental issues. Um, th but it's interesting. They've taken on much more of an issues-based than a candidate-based <laughs> focus. For, I think it has become much more about supporting Obama and his uh, agenda. This comes back to what I was saying on the actual <coughs> show about Sanders. Like, I'm, I've become very cynical over the years of hearing people go, oh, yeah, we've got a big group yeah. grassroots campaign. <laughs> I think Sanders does have a grassroots campaign. And, the, and if, uh, if, if he can keep it together, like, it, that, that could make a big difference in two years' time. Is it, is it his campaign or is it sort of Occupy Wall Street mm -hmm. and some Obama folks? Is it, did, did he make Who it? Who cares? The guy's 95. <laughs> like, if, if, there's, if there's a movement there, it will continue on without it. If there's no, there's, no, there's no leader of the Tea Party. They keep on, on going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Question but here. they're going to need direction and structure. Yeah. So. Uh, I just wanted to ask, following on, you kind of alluded to it also with the, uh, the fact that the, uh, the House is, the Congress is skewed towards the Republicans because they tend to vote. But there's also on both sides an anti-elitist sentiment, which is rather interesting. Um, and uh, a lot of people maybe in America who haven't normally come out to vote are probably angry enough, a bit like maybe the, the Hanson Palmer vote here, that they know what they're against rather than what they're for, and they just want to get up with a baseball bat and hit the existing people over the head. Um, so I just wanted to know, uh, the movements I see, for example, uh, Bernie Sanders has managed to get the superdelegates reduced for the next... Um, election, which is rather interesting, and that's obviously this idea of getting rid of the elitist establishment forces. Um, so I just wanted to know, do you think this will be an ongoing movement or will it fizzle out? And m my next question is a very contentious one. Uh, we know in America that uh, obviously voting voting isn't compulsory and you have to spend a hell of a lot of money just getting people out to vote and that obviously brings in all the corporate influences in terms of money required to fund that kind of campaign. Is there any chance that, I know that libertarian sentiments in America probably won't allow it, that compulsory voting might be sort of seen as a way of getting money out of politics and therefore getting the elites and the establishments which distort the process and the outcome out of politics? What do you think on that, Ali? Because yeah, a, a lot of Australians that. look at America and say, <laughs> look, you'd solve a lot of problems if it was compulsory to vote. Yeah, so this is going to be really controversial for you all, so I'll sort of push this back on. I was here for your election for the first time this year. Um, and I was very rah-rah compulsory before sort of coming in and seeing um, your election. And I actually think that for the U.S., it's not so much about requiring it. I think that actually takes away some of the excitement and maybe away some of the money as well, but it takes away some of the excitement, certainly. Our issue is not necessarily that. It's about access. So if you want to focus on something in the U.S., you focus on the access to voting. Why is it on a Tuesday? Why don't you, why don't you, you get hourly, you know, hourly workers don't get time off for that? You, you know, you make it really, really difficult for them to register to vote. So if you want to focus on something to get people to turn out at higher rates, start there, mm -hmm. then maybe see what happens. But I think the compulsory thing, for a lot of reasons in the U.S., isn't necessarily way, the, the way to start, either politically or from a policy perspective. I, I've never... Sorry, Bob. Yeah. No, I just wanted to add on, I totally agree with what you're saying, but that's part of this gerrymandering in a way. You know, we don't call that gerrymandering, that's a border issue, but it's another way of the control and why the house is the way it looks the way it does. I was going to say, I've literally never spoken to an American, either left wing or right wing, who wasn't shocked when they found out Australia has compulsory voting. The mm -hmm. idea of having compulsory voting in America, I think, would be alien to all of them. Right. That's never going to happen. But I would say two things to add to what Ali was saying is there are two movements right now, right now, that, that Obama's administration is trying to push, which Presumably, if Clinton's smart and she becomes president, she'll continue to push. One is public holiday on election day, mm -hmm. which is an easy way to get people out to vote, so they don't have to be working, because that's a big issue, especially for poor people. Yep. They, can't take, they can't take the day off, because also, unlike Australia, if they took the day off to vote, they'd get the sack. And so, the, uh, and so the, the, that, that's a big disincentive to vote. And secondly, um, compulsory, 
compulsory registration. Not compulsory voting, compulsory registration, where you're automatically, when you get a driver's license, registered to vote. Because at the moment, you need to queue up to register the vote, which is ridiculous. Yeah, we would call yeah. it automatic registration, yeah. not compulsory. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's right. Of course, as you know, the reason why voting is on a Tuesday is so the farmers can go to church on the Sunday, get in the horse and buggy, go and vote on the Tuesday, and then come back. And it's in November because they've just finished their harvest in autumn. Or All very logical. Yeah. Am I right in saying that there's, there's already automatic registration in Oregon, I think? And there's a couple of states there's where absentee, already has it. There's automatic absentee ballot. So if you are registered in Oregon, you get an absentee ballot automatically. They don't have polls in Oregon anymore. Yeah. Got another question? Uh, I know we touched on it in the show. Um, you were talking about the use of air power. The Democrats used that to target terrorism over the last eight years. Mm. And do you think that, I know Trump's been really strong on cracking down on terrorism. Do you think some people will vote for Hillary? Or if they see terrorism as a central issue because of the way you know, they've prosecuted the war over the last eight years? Like they've been pretty, pretty aggressive on drone strikes, special forces raids. Yeah, I mean, my point was more, this isn't a question I think that's been asked of Hillary enough in the campaign. So she hasn't really done very many one-on-one -on -one interviews with journalists. I think Trump has, in fact, probably done a little bit more of that. A little so, bit more. A little bit more. <laughs> a little bit, not a huge Each amount. Day. Yeah, but the, the kind of in-detail interview, the sort of Jake Tapper interview that was really quite effective at getting on Trump on, on David Duke. So if she is going to be in those interviews, I think it would be useful for people to say, OK, how effective have the use of drones been in Pakistan, which is a big thing when she was Secretary of State. How effective was the bombing of Libya? Uh, so it's just to get her to talk about what she may do as president in terms of, you know, air power is a terrible term in many regards. It's using military weapons to often kill, you know, targets, civilians and, you know, and enemies on the ground. So it's more of a question of, is that the style of uh, foreign policy that we can expect from Hillary Clinton? And if it is, I think we face the reality that the next American president is going to be more hawkish than Obama. Obama's more prudent approach is going to be seen as not the way forward. And I think that's unfortunate to some extent. I think Obama deserves a fair amount of credit for his foreign policy approach. He hasn't been perfect, but I think it's avoided all sorts of entanglements uh, that a Hillary Clinton foreign policy approach, which is maybe more muscular, more interventionist, could get the United States involved in. Bob, you look like you want to jump in there and add anything? I was going where you ended up. <laughs> <laughs> so you did. Yeah, I, I was going to say that, um, that I, think, I think Obama likes to not talk about drones so much. And the, and the, and the, the reason for that is because obviously the left-wing base isn't happy about the collateral damage, which happened, which there's just a fair amount of, and also there's all kinds of civil liberties issues about the due mm -hmm. process before mm -hmm. they decide who's going to get killed and who isn't going to get killed, yeah. because they, there's some rather loose definitions of what an enemy combatant is, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, I, which is actually on the note that Brendan was just saying. You would never find another president who was more made to be a civil libertarian president than Barack Obama. The guy was a constitutional law professor before he, before he became a, a president. And he was playing fast and loose with some of these drone guidelines. So you can only imagine what it's going to be like, whether it's Clinton or Trump, mm -hmm. in the next four years. Yeah. Yeah. And the other side of it is, or not other side, but in addition to, at this stage yeah. in the game, you know, his hands are clean in terms of war. He's been pulling people out, not putting any more of our young men and women into harm's way. A few more did go back over um, last month. But with that, you don't change horses when you're this close to a shoreline. Mm. So he's about over with his term. He's got a clean record on this. And he's not going to start rocking the boat mm. with the drones, with the terrorism, and all of that. He just wants to see it through and say, shalom. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let, yep. we've got time for one more quick question, yeah. I think. Yep, thank Ali. Ali's got to go. Ali's got to go. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, Ali. We seem to hear about the Libertarian Party quite a lot and hear from them, but nothing about the Green Party except for when um, Jill Stein offered Bernie Sanders the chance to lead the ticket. Why is it that the Green Party seems to get no mention at all? Look, I'll, I'll give you my answer and someone else can jump in. My, my answer about the reason we hear about the Libertarian Party but not the Green Party is because all anyone cares about is who's going to win electoral votes. And the Green Party do well in seriously blue states. Mm -hmm. So they get, let, let's say the Green Party gets 
6%, which would overperform anything they've done at the moment in polls. That's not going to be enough to lose a blue state. So the, the odds that they will affect the, the election by having a blue state turn red is basically zero. So for that reason, all the press care about is who's going to win the election, what's where the electoral vote, so they don't talk about it. Whereas the Libertarians, it actually potentially could turn a red state blue or a blue yeah. state a red. purple at least. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's right. Yeah. Gary, yeah, Gary Johnson gets 10% in Connecticut. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that, that, that could uh, cost that Trump cost. that state. Or Colorado. Colorado yeah. is, a, is a purple state where yep. libertarians do well. New Mexico as well. Yeah. So, like, so, so libertarians actually might affect the actual election outcome. I think that's the reason why. Yeah, what do you think, Brendan? Because uh, you know, one of the reasons as well that people focus on the libertarians is if Gary Johnson gets to 15% of the polls, suddenly he's in the debates like Perot was in, mm -hmm. in 92. But nobody really expects Jill Stein to get to 15%. I think the experience in 2000 with Ralph Nader was one that was um, very difficult for Greens to look back on. Um, Florida, there was, you know, the vote was so close in Florida, uh, they're still counting probably uh, in Bay <laughs> County and some places to work out Waiting you know, those to drop <coughs> whether they're going to you know, perforate or not. But, um, so that, that was, I think, uh, a chastening experience. For the American Greens, and there's no, there's not been anyone of the profile of Nader. I mean, Nader was a well-known figure in the United States because of his campaigns on automobile incidents and uh, safety sort of uh, regulations. So there hasn't been anyone of that profile, and it, and in many ways, it, it's reflective of the environment as an issue, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, tailing off in the United States since, you know, with the disappearance in some ways of Al Gore. We were talking about that earlier. You know, where is El Gore these El days? Yeah. Um, I was just going to add to that. On, on, on that note, though, something which is interesting is just how popular climate change regulation is becoming in polls. They don't like carbon taxes. They don't like, they don't like ETSs, but they, but they like climate regulations. And, the, and I think the Democrats have been shying away from that because they're worried about getting tarred with the carbon tax. But at some point in time, in the next few years, I think that's going to become a big issue because the polling is significant. We're talking 70s, 80s percent approval for climate regulation. And that so was one of Sanders' strong points, and it was a strong point for Obama. with the progressives yeah. and the in Sanders' 2008. In 2008, yeah. yeah. And, I mean, Bob, the, the fact that the, the Greens Party is only getting 1%, 2% in the US compared to, say, 15% in Australia, is that because the Democratic Party in the United States has managed to, to keep that, that, that part of the left in their party in a way that perhaps Labor in this country hasn't? I don't think it's been so much that they've been held back, but it just has a very slow growth. Mm -hmm. They just haven't gotten center stage. They haven't gotten the spotlight. OK. It's, yeah. Last question, just quickly. Thank you. Um, so I, I was thinking about what the Democrats have done over the past few years, where they've attempted to raise minimum wage, and they've brought in Obamacare, and they have done a lot of what is known as left-wing you know, policy. So I can't help but wonder, how important is Bernie Sanders really? Weren't the Democrats already following that path anyway? I mean, would they have gone down that route regardless of Bernie Sanders popping in on the election or not? I just, I just can't help but feel like he's a little bit over-appreciated in a sense. Is Bernie getting too much credit, Brendan, for things like the minimum wage? Well, look at the inequality figures in the United States. Look at unemployment rates amongst African-American men. So there are areas of clear weakness during the eight or seven and a bit years of the Obama presidency to say, look, inequality at the sort of extremes has probably increased as a president has talked about this issue quite a bit, but in kind of economic terms, uh, you know, it, it has got worse. Uh, so, you know, there are pockets of deep unemployment in the United States which have been very difficult to move. What has he exactly done on those issues? And even with middle class, um, middle class income has gone down in black communities, whereas for the country, the economy has gone up, but not when you start talking about pockets. It's a different place. Actually, I'll, I'll even go, that, go further than that. It's more than pockets, because I saw some numbers. The, the top, if you take away the top 100 metropolitan areas in America, mm -hmm. they still haven't crawled out of the jobs hole from the recession. They still haven't. Like, so... Like, the cities are going gangbusters, mm -hmm. but outside the cities, ain't going so yeah. well. You noticed how generic the conversation was mm. around the increase in the improvements, mm. you know, in both Obama's speech and 
what Hillary has been saying in the last month or so, mm -hmm. hanging on to the coattails of Obama, mm -hmm. which she has to do. Mm -hmm. But they're spoken in very general, broad brush terms, mm -hmm. not getting into the specifics. I, I was just going to say with the, the Bernie Sanders things, well, I'll, I'll give you some concrete, some concrete things that Bernie Sanders has, has achieved. Mm -hmm. uh, Clinton got, turned against the TPP. Obviously, because of Bernie Sanders, because she was definitely gunning that way before Bernie Sanders came along. Mm -hmm. Keystone Pipeline, mm -hmm. Clinton turned because of Bernie Sanders. Cold. Public option, Barack Obama has embraced when he 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 specifically excluded it during during the Obamacare discussions because of Bernie Sanders. Now, I'm not saying Bernie Sanders achieved everything. People watch his show know I'm no Bernie fan, but the fact is that there has been. There have definitely been some moves in the Democrat right? Party because of yeah. Bernie Sanders and people trying to go with him. And I'd say in particular, sorry, sorry, so don't just jump in, I was going to say, in particular, the thing we are talking before about the mayors and the midterms and all that kind of stuff, if Bernie follows through on that, that's going to be huge because it's, Hillary Clinton doesn't achieve a minimum wage increase. It's mayors and governors and it's, it's everyone. And, like, and, and if you haven't noticed, which you might not know, because it doesn't get much publicity, the Republicans dominate state parliament. They dominate the governorships, they dominate state congresses, and that's where the change happens. Right. Well, we are out of time for this question and answer session. It's going to be put up on the US Studies Centre website. You'll also find lots of good information there. If your passion is American politics, you might want to uh, check out some of the courses they've got, uh, one of which I'm teaching, one of which Brendan <laughs> teaches, many of which Brendan teaches. Uh, would you thank our panellists, Bob Heinbeck and Brendan O'Connor, in absentia, Bruce Walpe and Ali Sutton. And thank you all very much for coming along. We really appreciate it.